My name is Amy Arandia Estensen, and I'm so excited to be here with all of you educators and this wonderful panel of presenters today um, as we tackle the concept of rethinking equity in the outdoors. Um, so I educate for sustainability. That is my job. And this is what I did as a classroom teacher. This is also what I do now with schools and teachers. Um, this is work rooted in hope for a healthier future for our environment and for our communities. It is also rooted in a caring connection and sense of responsibility to the natural world. This is a characteristic that I likely share with all of you. And I imagine that making such meaningful connections possible for all of the young people we work with is something that we each aspire to. After all, given the climate crisis that we all face, it is what we need. So I wonder, as an educator, how do we do that? Researchers and experience tell us that early positive experiences, engaging in the natural world is an important factor in developing, developing environmental behaviors in adulthood. I would also add that we need to have a sense of belonging to and fall in love with the places in which we dwell. If we are to heal them, which is the work that we have in front of us. So let's pause for a moment to consider how you and how I develop these essential abilities of relationship to place. I am a first generation Filipina American settler in this land. My parents came here for work in the late 60s and raised their four children um, in the suburbs of upstate New York while also supporting their extended family back home. We were outsiders to this place, and I know I never developed a sense of belonging in this place where I grew up, a place and time where assimilation into whiteness was the expectation and our schooling did nothing to counter the constant messaging to people of color that you don't belong. But we were a stable middle-class family and my parents had the interest and the ability to spend time with us outdoors. At home, we rode bikes, played in the snow, picked apples, and tended the garden. We went camping and hiking and fishing and swimming in the ocean. Um, we had regular picnics and barbecues by the lake with close family friends. I share these images with you today of my family as a counter story to the dominant imagination of what kinds of people are recreating outdoors together. I know that my media-soaked American mind immediately conjures up images of joyful, able-bodied white people when I think of skiing and hiking and camping. So take a moment to recognize that limitation on our collective imagination. I am grateful to my parents for planting the seeds of joy and wonder and reverence for the natural world. I am especially grateful because I know that I that to have this kind of access to the outdoors is a privilege, but it shouldn't be. At school, it was a different story. Here you see my middle school on this map. It is just a few blocks away from the lake. I point that out because throughout my entire 13 years of public school education, I recall going outside for learning only two times, once in fourth grade and once in ninth grade. For me, school was a place that was disconnected from the natural world and all that was happening beyond those classroom windows. To contextualize this a little bit more, we zoom out to this picture where we see that the lake closest to my home base of Onondaga Lake, um, a lake Robin Wall Kimmerer has called the sacred and the Superfund. Um, it's just right there, right next to the school. Unknowingly, I grew up on the an ancestral lands of the Onondaga people. The toxic lake where we picnicked and rode our bikes is the site where five indigenous nations came together as the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee Confederacy and agreed to live by the great law of peace. It is also the site where generations of chemical companies dumped their toxic waste taking the shoreline with white sludge and coating the bottom of the lake with mercury. 
I share this because I see this as a tragic missed opportunity for our schools and our community. What if my schools had centered interconnectedness, sense of place, and the ability for each of us to make a difference? What if while generations of industrial workers were dumping toxic waste into that sacred lake, schools were also nourishing a love of place, a sense of responsibility to our natural human communities in generations of school children. As educators, this is our responsibility to our shared future. We know that who gets access to positive experiences in the natural world is limited by systems of generational inequities and biases. And schools offer us this amazing lever for change. Each year we get the chance to reimagine what is possible for our youth today and for the future we are currently creating. The question of how we shift school culture and practice to instill a deep sense of community and belonging is what our panel here today is addressing. As you listen in, I challenge you to push the edges of your own imagination of what is possible, who we envision as being in relationship with the natural world, and who the agents of change might be. I'll end with these words from Dr. Ebony Elizabeth Thomas, who writes about the interplay of race and imagination and literature. When describing what's needed to make our world anew, she states it requires the emancipation of imagination itself. So with that, I'm going to turn um, the microphone over to our first speaker, James Edward Mills. He is, I'll stop sharing for you all. He is a freelance journalist who specializes in telling stories about outdoor recreation, environmental conservation, acts of charitable giving, and practices of sustainable living. Welcome, James. Great. Amy, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and um, with it a series of slides. And um, first of all, I wanted to um, say thank you for um, Jenny for inviting me to um, present today. Um, I have the pleasure of writing a feature story for the uh, Green School National Network Catalyst Quarterly Magazine, specifically taking a look at the role that green schools can play in the lives of children of color. And I'm going to basically give you a few of the highlights from the reporting that came from that story, um, as well as a, a case study on how green schools can impact the life of a single child. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Malcolm Dribbs. And Malcolm um, is a student at the Aldo Leopold Nature Center um, here at the city of Madison, Wisconsin, where I'm based. Um, I have the pleasure of living and working in the land of the Ho-Chunk Nation, um, a land known for time and memorial as de Jope. And wherever you are, I'd like to encourage you uh, to make sure that you acknowledge the ancestral homelands of the place that you once called home. And in this place where Malcolm lives, um, he's nine years old. Um, he's from um, a Madison, Wisconsin, born and raised. He also loves the outdoors. Um, he wants to be a hairstylist when he grows up. He, at the age of nine, he's already made this uh, conscious decision as to his career choice. But um, Malcolm was diagnosed with um, autism at the age of 18 months. Um, and he was later diagnosed with um, hyper, um, I actually with uh, attention deficit hyperactivity uh, disorder. Um, he's also um, prone to disruptive behavior. Um, and he was expelled from um, several indoor schools and daycare facilities um, from the age of six. Um, and also um, he is a child of mixed race heritage. Um, basically all of this categorized Malcolm as difficult to teach. And one of the things that was remarkable about Malcolm um, was he had doting parents that were able to, to afford him a variety of different 
options. And one of them was to allow him to attend the Aldo Leopold Nature Center, where I have the, uh, the privilege of sitting on the board as its vice president. And I had the chance to visit with Malcolm um, in one of his outdoor classroom settings um, just about two weeks ago. And here his class is going on a day of snowshoeing. And if anybody has been following the weather, it is um, at this moment um, three degrees above zero here in Madison, but they're holding classes outdoors every day. And I, I was um, you know, amazed to discover that the education is continuing despite the pandemic um, and despite the cold weather temperatures. But here at the Aldo Leopold Nature Center, uh, Malcolm has virtually no disruptive behavior. He has improved his cognitive abilities um, and he also has improved his social skills. Um, he started attending school here at the age of six. He's now nine and he's a model student. Malcolm is learning and most important, Malcolm is happy. And all of this changed um, uh, when I spoke to his father, he said that being able to go to school outdoors allows Malcolm to get his wiggles out. And I took um, him um, to mean um, that nature-based education makes a difference. And by taking a look at this one student, we can see exactly how nature-based edu education can make a difference. And we just need to listen to Malcolm's teacher, um, my um, good friend and the um, director of the Aldo Leopold Nature Center. Here, Malcolm can just be a kid. Those other schools just didn't address his particular learning style in a classroom, his behavior might be disruptive, but here he can leave all of his, uh, release all of his energy without being a problem. And that's at the core, I think in many ways for the success that Malcolm is enjoying now. Research shows us that even as little as 20 minutes in a natural space can raise the attention performance levels of children relative to the same amount of time in most other setting, settings. And what's remarkable about that is that as little as 20 minutes, but can you, you can imagine an entire day of spending time in the outdoors, what, um, what that can do to um, a young person's ability to, um, to learn. Um, also, um, a 2009 study published in the Journal of Attention uh, Disorders um, concludes that green outdoor environments can enhance attention not only in the general population, but also in ADHD populations. Doses of nature might serve as a safe, inexpensive, widely accessible tool in the toolkit for managing ADHD symptoms. So nature can actually be used as medicine to not only treat the uh, kids with behavioral um, disorders, but also uh, um, with the general public. The Leopold Nature Center is working specifically to create um, a learning environment that is designed to be um, inclusive, diverse, equitable, but most importantly, accessible. Um, a new initiative that we've launched is called IDEA. And the idea in this case is to make the outdoors more accessible to young people. But unfortunately, not all children have equitable access to nature. Um, and that gets us to the point of our discussion today. People of color are, effect, are actively prevented from residing in suburban neighborhoods across the United States by restrictive practices commonly known as redlining. Now, this is a practice that has historic um, legacy going all the way back to the 1930s, um, was made illegal in 1968, but was practiced um, well through the middle of the Reagan administration in the late eight, um, 1980s. And it was um, even under the new, um, the new Biden administration, um, we're looking to dismantle the ill effects of redlining on um, our contemporary modern society. 64% of people of color live in the most um, burdened communities for pollution vulner and vulnerability. Only 31% of non-Hispanic white people live in those areas. Um, and that's from a study from Cal Environ Screen, a environmental um, um, resources management organization based in California. Children of color are also disproportionately subjected to disciplinary punishment. Um, research using administrative database sets and longitudinal samples clearly show that Black American students are far more likely to be subjected and expelled, conditional on an official referral, more likely um, to receive stiffer punishments. 
Okay, so that we have um, not only disproportionate access to nature, but also a higher propensity of disproportionate punishment. And as it happens, nature-based education helps us to solve two very specific problems. Uh, number one, an outdoor classroom sets uh, levels the playing field so that each student can experience in common the wonders of nature. Every child can share equally the tools of learning provided by elements of sunlight, soil, wind, and water. And so that um, we basically eliminate the restrictions um, imposed by redlining and, and um, racial and cultural discrimination. The second thing that nature does is that it, in these environments um, where cognitive abilities, disabilities and behaviors might be disruptive indoors are more easily tolerated or even remedied. All children, regardless of their race or ethnicity, can adopt a comfortable learning style that is best suited to their specific needs. And here we um, were also offered two very positive solutions. Um, and to, in order to achieve um, accessible outdoor education, we need to make nature-based education more accessible by lowering the economic barriers to access. One of the things that we're doing at the Aldo Leopold Nature Center is providing um, scholarship from disproportionately under-resourced um, young people and their families in our community, making our, our school more accessible. And I think it's also critical that we directly engage community organizations, school boards, and parents and educate them on the value of green schools for children of color um, so that young people like Malcolm and other um, young people of his age and also of his ethnic, ethnic heritage um, can um, enjoy the benefits of a green school education so that we ultimately make green schools accessible to everyone. Um, thank you very much for your time and attention, and um, I will turn it back over to Amy. Thank you, James, so much for um, telling us more about your work at the Aldo Leopold Nature Center um, and framing some of the conversations that we're going to be hearing a little bit more from our next two presenters on about that work. Um, I want to take a moment to remind everyone that we do have three presenters and after this we're going to go into breakout rooms and um, think about takeaways and questions we have for our presenters. So as we go along, you may want to just take notes because I know during the last session I began to forgot, forget what I heard earlier as I heard new voices and new ideas. Um, so moving on to our second presenter today, Heather Hairston is joining us. She's a former principal and a current EcoRise board member. Uh, she has worked as an educator in public schools for over 20 years, with most of her career in early and elementary education and school leadership. Heather has developed a passion for improving outcomes for students and communities through leveraging innovation and community partnerships as a vehicle to promote advocacy within her community. Welcome, Heather, to our conversation today. Uh, thank you so much, Amy, for that beautiful introduction. And thank you, James, for helping to remind us not only about the ideals of what we want to see for our places, but offering realistic solutions for ways that we can begin to disrupt some structures that we know are often not in service of students who are in the most need. So uh, thank you for that. I'm gonna share my screen really quickly. I always kind of mess this up. So let me make sure that I think we can see. Can everybody see that? Perfect. Um, and so <laughs> I wanna just start out by saying um, a little bit about the work that I was able to help lead and facilitate at my school. Um, as Amy mentioned in my introduction, I am uh, just finished up a six year principalship at this amazing school in Washington, DC. Um, you wouldn't know to look at it now, but when I was appointed as the principal there, I was the third principal in four years. Um, we were one of the lowest performing schools in the district. Uh, there was a 28% special ed population there was high turnover, low trust, and no enrollment, and all of the things that we know are problems when we think about what we, um, school reform and school turnaround. And so um, it was my first principalship. I knew that I had a vision for what I wanted, not only for the school, but for the entire community. And so I had to say to myself, okay, Heather, well, you're the principal now. You have all these decisions that you need to make. This is relying on you. 
what is it that you really want for this space? What do you want it to feel like? What do you want kids to experience while they're there? And it had me begin to think a lot about the experiences that I had as, as a student growing up in um, the city, understanding the importance of public school education, and also understanding that for many students, what they are getting inside of school spaces has the ability to transform and impact the trajectory of their lives. And so I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to be here for a while, the least I'm going to want to do is make sure that children are happy when they're here. A lot of times as educators and leaders, there are things that are beyond our control that we can't account for, but there are some things that we can manage and control here in our spaces for our students. And one of those things was our core values. We said that no matter what, every day we would work hard, achieve and inspire. That we wanted to, that no matter where you were, no matter what your reading score was, what your ability level was, what your first home language was, that you could do those things. Um, and so I always start my presentations about my school with this picture because it, it serves as a, a wonderful example of who we want it to be and who we tried to aspire and align our work to be. Um, so uh, this discussion and panel is grounded in equity, but we can't really talk about equity without talking about social justice. And we have to also understand that equity and social justice goes across multiple domains. The things that we see happening in classrooms are directly impacted by communities, which are directly impacted by jobs, which are directly impacted by healthcare. So that the ways these things manifest themselves in school settings cannot be solved in isolation if they are caused not by isolation. So what I have here is here are two pictures of a small map of my ward where um, I was born and where my school was. You'll see on this left side, some data around physical activity. And we often hear of people referring to particular urban settings as being food deserts. But I wanted to put these two pictures up side by side because not only are we looking at places where there are not a lot of outdoor spaces, where there's a high density of murder and crime, where students aren't able to go outside and where families aren't able to trust the things that are happening in their community. If you overlay that with this food desert, you'll also see that there are some clear gaps between the opportunities both in outdoor spaces and in food, health, and education that can be impacting students. So I, I know that you are on mute, but I want you to kind of guess where do you think in Ward 7 that my school was located, knowing what you know now, high turnover, high sped. If you guessed anywhere in this far in quadrant that is far away from spaces that are safe to play and far away from food access, then you would be correct. And so when we think about what we wanna do to disrupt and to change and to shift the ways that schools have been organized and the ways that they are in service or not in service of students, we have to begin thinking more innovatively around what it is that we can control what do we want to do and how can we create more opportunities so that students have strong sense of belonging both within their schools and within their communities. So I have this role and I'm like, well, hey, what do you have to do first? Anybody who has taken on a new role or who has engaged in any kind of turnaround work knows that the first thing you need to do is to build trust with the people. Um, you have to also be able to give people a reason to want to come to your school. Washington DC is a district of choice. And so the other key element is that we had to be thoughtful about what are the kind of opportunities that we are creating for students in school that will make people want to choose us as a place to be. You can go to schools that you choose. And so if you don't have an opportunity, if, if you can't make school worthwhile, then why would you come? We also realized that we needed to leverage relationships and not just relationships with particular students and families, but relationships with other stakeholders in the community. We realized that many of our families had also attended C.W. Harris. They were families who had been rooting there for years and years. And so we realized that there was this very valuable opportunity 
to help both our students and our teachers and members of the community have a better understanding of the things that we were prioritizing so that they could both be partners in that work and also support their students in that. The other thing that we had to do was think really strategically about what kind of kids we were trying to create. We wanted to create situations where our students were thoughtful, where they were curious, where they were innovative, where they were problem solving, where they were collaborating with each other. And the reality is that too many of our systems set up in schools are not set up to do that. They're set up to control. They're set up to silence. They're set up to limit. They're not set up in a way where we are encouraging curiosity and problem solving. And so we had to think about that as a way that we could both turn our school around and answer the call for this responsibility that we felt like we wanted to have for our students and families. Um, one of the things that's important to me to think about is the sense of the responsibility of the leader. And whether you are a school leader, a leader in your classroom, a leader in your organization, or a leader in your home, that the Harvard Business Journal had an article and they talked about that the four most important leadership skills were often those that were the weakest in leaders. Inspiring commitment, leading employees, strategic management, and I'm sorry, strategic planning and change management. And what we know about schools and specifically some of the struggles that are happening right now as we try to manage through this pandemic and ensure that schools are still happening reminds us of the deficits in these areas. And so we wanted to also think about that in the sense of what are, how can we transfer these skills not only to our leadership and to our teachers, but also to our students and our families. Um, this access and equity in education is something that is problematic. And the huge reason that it's been problematic has less to do with devices and more to do with this narrative that school is the only place that you can learn. And so if we set up a system that makes people think all learning happens in school, when you take school away, the assumption is, well, there must not be any learning. And what we know is that that is not true. Students are learning in their homes. They can learn in their communities. They learn from observing. They learn from asking questions. They learn from problem solving together. And so one of the things that we had to do um, was think about who are the partners that we can align with right now today who, who share our vision, who share our commitment, who have resources, and how can we use those as opportunities to enhance what happens day to day in our classrooms with students. So here are three of our partners, EcoRise, which I sit on the board for and I love amazingly, um, really helped serve, uh, stand and fill in a gap for many of the programs um, and incentives and projects that our students wanted to do. They wanted to go out and build things and ask questions and make observations. And as many of you know, educators funding is often limited in those areas. And so one of the things that we did is we aligned ourselves with partners who would help us find the resources to fund projects that we wanted to do that were important to our kids. We also had to figure out this issue around food desert and food equity and food justice. And so we partnered with Food Prints to create opportunities where we had cooking demonstrations and cooking classrooms in our schools. At first we were in trailers and we didn't have beautiful kitchens. We literally had a crock pot and an electric hot plate. But that didn't stop students from going outside and gardening, from bringing in carrots, from making observations, from doing research, from actually feeling and touching and smelling and manipulating and using these carrots. Um, and even in a virtual setting, we were able to continue that work. So what you see here in the middle are some students who were engaged in a food prints lesson during the pandemic where we were still helping to build those skills and capacities with them, knowing that the decisions that students are making in schools can often transfer into their homes. We then had to figure out how are we going to make sure that we are meeting Maslow's hierarchy of needs and giving students and families the basic things that they need. So we were fortunate enough to partner with Martha's Table to provide food distribution and open markets that happened once a month where students and families could come in and do grocery shopping. 
Now, this wasn't even about just picking up groceries and then going away, but also offering an opportunity for students to try new recipes, to get new interests, to integrate math and science and, and PE and wellness and all of these other subjects that we had been teaching in isolation and using food and the environment and the classroom and the outdoor spaces as opportunities to merge those things together. Um, there was another picture that I wanted to show. It didn't come up, but it is a picture of um, my students who are outside um, growing and planting. And what you know, and I'll tell you this, I don't know how many of you have ever had recess duty, but I doubt that you have ever seen kids outside and unhappy. They are smiling and laughing and running and watching and enjoying the world. And these are the kinds of opportunities that we need to be thinking about how we can create them more for students and not buying into this negative deficit mindset that, oh, low performance schools shouldn't be outside learning. They need to focus on reading and math first. Or, oh, these schools that live in these particular communities, we know that they need to care about the environment, but there's some other things that they need to do first. If we continue to promote that narrative, we will always be at a deficit base. There is no reason that any child cannot go outside, cannot enjoy what is happening in the world and use that opportunity to learn. It doesn't necessarily only rely on both just the educator and students. This is a responsibility of families, of leaders, of stakeholders, of all the people in the community. And so what I would like to leave you all with is just the importance of remembering that we have a responsibility to leave a place better than we found it. Even if it's not perfect, as a leader, I encourage you to leverage your voice to remind folks that this thought of having good clean spaces is not just an image that is designed for certain kinds of kids in certain kind of communities with certain kind of access. And that if we want to be true advocates of a better world, a future for ourselves and for our children, that we can start today in every community and in every space. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Amy. Thank you so much, Heather. I am smiling and I see a lot of smiles here in our group um, after listening to you speak. And I just, the emphasis on relationships and working in community um, was so clear to me through your storytelling. Thank you for sharing about how you did that work on the ground. Um, we are going to hear from our third presenter next, uh, Isabel Anaya. She is a teacher, a model teacher at Charles L. Kuntz Junior Elementary School in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, she is a teacher who is dedicated to making a difference in the environment and igniting passion in others. So we warmly welcome our third presenter here during this session, um, Isabel Anaya. Thank you, Amy. Um, you know, hearing from Heather right now just brings so much joy um, only because to be surrounded with such a group of passionate people who also share that same love of getting the kids out in nature is something that, you know, um, I think that more, not just educators, like Heather was saying, but just everybody in general just needs to be a part of, you know, and learn. So um, I'm going to share my screen. And just like Heather, um, I always tend to mess this up too. So let me see if I can do this. Okay, am I sharing my screen? Yes, that looks great, okay, thank you. I was gonna say, I can't tell. <laughs> okay, so um, my name is uh, Isabel Nayam. I am, uh, this is my 19th year in uh, working with Northside Independent School District in San Antonio, Texas. I've taught um, third grade and fifth grade at a Title I campus for nine years, serving as the collaborative classroom teacher. Where I have um, ha where I had the support of a special education teacher to help meet the needs of all my students, um, and I am currently at a campus in Holotus, Texas, which is right next to San Antonio, um, and have been working there for um, the past ten years, teaching fifth grade. Uh, my teaching career um, has allowed me to work with students of all different abilities, 
students with um, autism and behavior needs, uh, emotional needs, as well as our gifted and talented students. But I would like to start off by telling you a little background about myself and how my love of connecting students with nature came to be. I was born and raised in the very small town of East Chicago, Indiana, just a short trip from downtown Chicago and the shores of Lake Michigan. And East Chicago is one of Northwest Indiana's uh, first truly industrial cities. The city was originally known as the Twin City um, with East Chicago being separated from a Western section and the Indiana Harbor side, which is where I grew up. Um, the harbor, which is uh, known as, was a population dominated by workers um, at Inland Steel. My dad immigrated um, to the harbor uh, in the early 70s to work in the steel mills. And like many other immigrants, uh, he was undereducated, um, worked long, strenuous hours at the steel mill to make a better living for our family. Uh, the city steel mill, you know, uh, with its unpleasant odors, as I remember growing up, were far different um, from the fresh sense and the rural life that my parents knew um, in Mexico. And so going out of nature, for me as a kid, consisted of visiting the um, Indiana National Dunes, having cookouts, and tackling the dune challenges, but that truly was the extent of it in that area growing up. My true love of nature, though, actually came from traveling um, to my parents' hometown, which is in Tangancicuaro, Michoacan, and you can see it on the map. It's, um, you know, a pretty far drive from East Chicago. We would probably spend, you know, 24 hours. My dad is one of those that would drive, you know, straight head on. Um, and, uh, in, and that's where my love of, of nature truly came. Michoacan is surrounded by uh, gorgeous uh, mountain ranges and um, beautiful areas. And so many of my childhood memories were visiting a lot of the indigenous towns. Um, our little town of Tangancicuaro is actually um, came from what's called the, the Purepecha people, a native tribe there. And you still see a lot of that culture still embedded in there. Um, we also visited a lot of the, the natural springs, um, El Lago de Camecuaro, that's the third picture down there. Um, have a lot of memories growing up as a kid there. And then even the beautiful monarch sanctuary of El Rosario, which is Michoacan is uh, known a lot for that too. Um, and a lot of this has been passed on, you know, from my family to myself growing up. And then I am fortunate that I have been able to pass that on to my son who is now um, a senior in high school. And so that's kind of hard to, to take in. Um, but when I became an educator though, see if I can move on. When I became an educator though, I knew that connecting students to nature was important. And I was determined to find a way to, of doing so only because I really didn't have that growing up. You know, unless it was my connection to nature um, in Michoacan, that living in that industrial, you know, industrial city of East Chicago, we really didn't have that um, as an opportunity to do so. So if I had a choice, um, I would teach everything outdoors, just like Heather said. I mean, connecting the kids out in nature is probably one of the best things that you can do. Um, I believe that outdoor learning space and access to nature encourages students um, skills, a lot of skills such as problem solving. Um, however, um, from my personal experience, not from my own personal experience, that's not always, you know, a lot of students don't always have that opportunity to do so, you know, and it can be, you know, from, you know, a lack of uh, money, you know, cost of programs, um, parental permission or support even, uh, lack of information, uh, not being aware of the opportunities that are out there for them, um, or even some students feeling like it's not for them, you know. And so as educators, I think that's where it's important for that we come in to provide those opportunities for students to be outdoors, to look for programs that sponsor, that sponsor outdoor um, student activities and to seek out volunteers with similar interests um, as well. So these are some of the organizations that um, I have been involved in over the past years um, in helping create that bridge for the outdoors with my students. And so um, the PepsiCo recycling program um, Keep San Antonio Beautiful. I've been a board member with them for several years now. The Master Gardeners um, AgriLife Extension Program through Texas A&M, 
National Wildlife Federation, the Monarch Heroes Program, EcoRise, and then even through our own school district, um, they're, they're starting to add more uh, as far as connecting students with gardening programs. And so that's where Project Acorn comes in. And I'll tell you a little bit more about these organizations as I go through uh, my presentation. Um, so these are my kiddos from several years, you know, kind of all over, just kind of give you a little snapshot of them. Um, I am the sponsor of several after school clubs um, on my campus, including solar cars, robotics, theater, um, and then Eco Friends, which is my environmental club. And you'll see them pictured a lot in, uh, in these pictures. And Eco Friends is responsible for maintaining both of our vegetable garden as well as our pollinator garden beds. Um, we play an active part in the National Wildlife Federation Eagle Schools Monarch Hero Program and have also participated in the PepsiCo Recycling Program over the past eight years. Our school has actually won um, the, the PepsiCo Recycling Program a couple of times, um, earning a little over $150,000 just by recycling, which is pretty incredible to, to keep that in mind. Um, and the pictures, the, the bags in the pictures are not trash. That's actually the amount of recycling that we collect on any given day. So that is our uh, curbside Wednesday recycling, obviously pre-COVID. Um, and uh, but we still continue that even you know with some some safety measures in place uh, now that you know we're in this situation. Um, and it's obviously no secret, you know, just as if you heard from the other panelists that. Um, being outdoors provides many benefits and having a garden provides a lot of benefits over and above just the fresh produce that's that you know that we that the students get. When I first started at my current campus in 2011, the back of the school was a flat pouring space. With the help of programs like Monarch Heroes and EcoRise and PepsiCo, um, our school now has a thriving home for for, ma for many pollinators. Our school garden is built by the students and with the help of a lot of our community members. They help with the design of the garden, the selection of the plants, the solarization process, and of course, getting their hands dirty um, in planting and in weeding. Um, our gardens are more than just the green space. They're a hands-on um, outdoor classroom that teaches children self-regulation and mindfulness, which is really important. Oops. And mindfulness and are also inclusive to um, uh, a lot of learning abilities and backgrounds in students. It's not just limited to a group. Um, and the result is what I see on a daily basis, you know, um, an increase in academic performance, a decrease in negative behavior, increase in empathy towards other students and organisms living in our own um, backyard. And this is my, um, oops, let me go back. Um, we have, uh, with uh, the Monarch Heroes Program, we have uh, created a beautiful sanctuary for monarch butterflies through our Monarch Heroes Program and are now working towards increasing the biodiversity by adding new native plants to attract uh, other pollinators such as hummingbirds and bees um, as they continue on on their journey. We're adding shelter also for other migratory birds species that often um, nest at our school as well. Um, the students are this year are involved in um, the nectar propagation station and you'll see the my students down at the bottom um, collecting some some seeds. Uh, my students are learning how to propagate native plants from seed cuttings root division from our own habitats. Um, and the neat thing about it is that once they go through the process of collecting the, the, the documentation of the growth process and once the plants have grown um, they're idea is to take what we have grown through this propagation station and actually take it to schools um, in other areas of San Antonio that are that might not be as as privileged as the school that I'm currently working with. Um, and I'm always looking for ways just to connect the students, you know, to the natural world. Um, every year they participate in what's called the symbolic migration through Journey North. Uh, the picture in the top corner with the arrow actually shows the symbolic butterfly that my students made. And it actually made it all the way to El Rosario in Michoacan. And I had the privilege a couple years ago to actually go to the school um, and see it and took pictures there and was able to share that with my students. So they're able to see the connection um, that they're doing and they're helping out with. Um, my students also participate in what's called the Great Texas Birding Classic, um, and it's basically bird watching tournaments 
um, put on by Texas Parks and Wildlife, um, and they learn how to identify birds by their color, the size and the sound, but most importantly, they're able to enjoy time in nature. And we have a lot of the parents that go with us and volunteers that, that join us in, um, in a lot of these activities. Um, and volunteering. Volunteering is such a great way for students to gain personal experience um, and build that positive culture in our community. Um, volunteering creates lasting you know, impacts on their health and their well-being, but it's not just about getting volunteers to go, which is a huge part, right? But it's also about having students give back to the community. So in this picture, you actually see um, the Texas, Texas AgriLife Extension programs. They have a lot of docents that come out and provide their expertise and their knowledge to it. We actually have Snooze AM Eatering that we've partnered with and they do a lot of community garden days um, with them. And you'll see those in the pictures as well. But one of the, the best things to do is to actually get the students out there volunteering and giving back. So on this one here, as you can see, it's um, Keep San Antonio Beautiful. And Keep San Antonio Beautiful is an affiliate of Keep Texas Beautiful. And I have been working with them um, on the board for several years now. And we're always looking for ways to provide um, volunteer opportunities for students and our community, whether it's through um, cleanups at parades, recycling, um, community cleanups, um, fall sweep through um, Keep Texas Beautiful or Keep America Beautiful, um, and just finding ways for the students to be able to, to give back uh, and connect with, with nature and see the importance of, of connecting. And of course, having them be stewards of the environment, right? And so stewardship means a sense of connection to and caring about and responsibly, responsibility for each other and the natural world around us. And how do we help students become stewards of the environment. Um, and a lot of that is just allowing them to be leaders in the, in the community, allowing them to become teachers and experts. So in the pictures here, you'll see them, you know, this, the students have presented to um, people such as uh, um, uh, um, somebody from the EPA, uh, a lot of important leaders within our community. And, you know, they were presenting their eco audits that they do through Eco Rise, you know, and how they're using those eco audits to collect data to improve things within our campus or within our community. Um, you know, having them go out and tag butterflies, you know, through Monarch Watch and uh, just all kind of different, you know, opportunities, but, you know, letting them be the, the leaders and the spokespeople um, out uh, and others and, you know, the more that they feel empowered, the more that they're going to actually live it and take it with them as they continue on, um, which is my ultimate goal, I think, as an educator is not just for it to stay with me or for it to stay with them in fifth grade, but for them to continue on um, as they go through. Um, one of the other opportunities that I provide is are called Saturday family field trips and just connecting families and nature. Again, sometimes these families don't even realize that, you know, some of the, the beautiful areas that are around us that that are free, you know, or, you know, at a low cost. Um, sometimes I gather, um, I'm able to um, get a bus from the school district and just, you know, tell the kids, you know, tell the parents, drop off your kids and I'll take them with me, you know, let, let them come with me and I'll take them on a trip to, you know, Government Canyon or, um, you know, Guadalupe State Park or any areas just to be able to, to show them that they can connect with nature, you know, and be part of it. And of course, just have fun swimming in the waters. Um, EcoRise, as I mentioned, you know, it's a huge program, you know, I mean, they, if you are not familiar with EcoRise, um, the information will be there later, and I'm more than happy to, you know, to, to tell you a little bit more about it, but it has a great opportunity for students to do eco audits, connect with nature, um, and find ways for them to feel empowered to make a difference and a change um, in their school. Um, our students uh, had our first water filling station at the school, and so they were really proud of that. Um, they've added bird feeders and um, bird baths to increase, you know, the diverse that the biodiversity of birds on there. Um, they've increased, they've added air plants uh, to the class, um, a garden shed. I mean, there's all kinds of things that that the students just feel empowered to do right now. Um, our my current class right now is working on a program to increase pollinators, not just within our campus, but at their homes. And so we're trying to find ways to do starter kits um, so that each of the fifth graders can take one home and, and plant with them. Um, and, and here you see, these are my current students. And so, and some former students as well. But what I love is that they share with me pictures of what they're doing at home. 
you know, so it doesn't just stay in the classroom. You know, this is something, I mean, that's a student, the mom's, you know, calling me on the phone and texting me and saying, okay, you know, I have Tristan here and I have Aaron here and you started a garden at school and now they want to start a garden, you know, at the house. What do I do? Because I don't have a green thumb. And so just being able to share that and the kids sharing the pictures of, you know, the stuff that they're growing at home and, and what they're doing. So hearing back from those is pretty exciting. Um, that is actually our namesake. That is Mr. Coons there sitting at our, in our garden. Um, and that space is used a lot by our students, you know, as um, a place where, you know, they go and just enjoy and, and take care. So hopefully, I know I, I tend to talk pretty fast, but I hope I gave you enough information and a little insight into my world. And um, as a teacher at Coons Elementary and um, I, I, the most I can tell you is, you know, get ways, find ways for educators to connect their students out in nature and, um, they'll thrive. So. Start with Isabel. And there's a question about how you incorporate this work into your curriculum, knowing that we've got a full curriculum already and so many things that teachers are responsible for. How do you do this? So that's, that's a big question that comes up a lot. And, um, when I'm presenting this to other educators, um, and the, the, the part of it is that everybody teaches science or math connection in some way um, or a community connection. And so looking for your, in Texas, we have what, what are called TEKS, but looking at your standards and seeing ways to be able to connect that. Um, a lot of the, the curriculum that I use with my students in regards to environmental education is through EcoRise. Um, it's called Sustainable Intelligence, and it's offered to a lot of schools, you know, all over, not just in Texas, you know, all over the United States. So that's something to look into. Um, and it goes from pre-K all the way to high school. So I know that there was a question on high school math and how do you connect it with high school math. Um, I would definitely look into the EcoRise um, curriculum and find ways of being able to incorporate that environmental education um, along with um, with your curriculum and whatever content area that you're doing. Thank you so much. And Heather, we have a similar question with you um, from an administrative lens of, um, sorry, I'm trying to get my Jamboard straight here. Um, thinking about, um, you know, how do you help teachers and staff to make time um, in a, in a standards-based world where we're often teaching to standards? How do we incorporate this from your point of view from where you stand as in school leadership? Yep, I mean, I think to me, the thing that was important is that we always try to encourage our teachers to be really reflective about if what they were required to teach was worth their time and energy. Um, and so often we would, have teachers who would be very frustrated or bored and spend a bunch of time rewriting lessons or finding books that were culturally relevant or, or finding things that had relevance to their own schools and communities. And so we really thought to ourselves, what is the most important thing? And what are the other ways that we can get teachers to be thoughtful about the planning that they do in order to both meet the standards that are required, but also give them opportunities to develop the things that were of interest to them. Um, if teachers aren't interested and curious and having fun while they're teaching, then students certainly aren't gonna be interested in having fun while they sit there and learn. And so for us, it was just a decision that we made um, and, and a key element to that was training for our internal coaches and making sure that our literacy and um, ELA coaches, that our members of our leadership team also kind of bought into this decision we were making that said we want to prioritize standards and make what we teach to students valuable and worth their time. Thank you. Um, and James, related to this, there's a question here about um, for school work in the upper grades and connecting standards and academics to the outside world for older students? Well, as it happens, the Aldo Leopold Nature Center also did a program last year with um, middle school kids, you know, so not just the elementary school grades, but the um, heading into junior high school. And there it was about incorporating their earth science curriculum with real practical on the ground science using, you know, basic models of 
of natural science research. You know, and so they were writing stories about and you know papers of, about the flora and fauna on the site, as well as the natural history, the heritage, and legacy of Aldo Leopold as as a naturalist. The importance of um, engaging in uh, forestry preservation, you know, much like the work of of Gifford Pinchot and the creation of the National Forest um, Service. So, a lot of the crossover, you know, is it goes beyond the notion of just play. You know, a lot of it is really substantively based scientific research and, and development in a living classroom, you know, where they can actually see photosynthesis unfold and everything else that goes along with it. You know, and, and along the way, they can also learn, you know, the practical skills of math and, and geography um, you know, meteorology, I mean, just name, name the subject. You know, the, the critical difference is, you know, they, they're not pinned to a desk and chairs, you know, they're sitting um, around a log circle, you know, or they are um, walking a trail or, you know, visiting the, um, the, the turtle pond. I mean, there, there are a wide variety of different alternatives to simply being stuck behind a desk, you know, and frankly, that application, um, is worthwhile, you know, to students at every level. I, I teach a course here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and in the days when we don't have COVID, um, you know, our, our classroom is extended to um, education, you know, outside, literally just being out under a blue sky, you know, as opposed to, you know, being sequestered in a classroom, you know, so it, it has practical applications all the way up to uh, sophomores and seniors in college. Thank you. Uh, we're going to come back to Isabel with a question of practicality. Um, you offered so many inspirational ideas for cross-curricular and community-based work. Um, the question is, how do we make it happen? So any tips you have to share would be helpful. Um, I don't sleep. We're just, you know, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, you know, you you just, I guess you just find ways to to do it. So I, um, a lot of this pro, a lot of these programs that I do, um, you know, I, I reach out to my community members. I reach out to volunteers, you know, to kind of um, help out with the different organizations or um, I'm always looking for uh, like the Keep San Antonio Beautiful and all the, the volunteers for that, for the recycling um, so a lot of it is just, you know, incorporating at that right now, currently, um, I'm still teaching. So I have, um, 14 kids in person and I have 10 virtual and I do everything live on zoom all day long and I have an after school club. And so my after school clubs meet, um, Tuesday, Wednesdays and Tuesday through Friday, um, for the different organizations, um, with that. And then, you know, a lot of, a lot of just connecting it with parents and, you know, finding time and opportunities to, to be able to, to do that. Um, I don't know. Does that answer it, Amy? <laughs> it's certainly helpful, but you should sleep just so you don't. <laughs> no, no, I do. You know what? It, a lot of it is based on the, the student smiles. You know, I have students who I've taught, you know, many years ago who come back and say, listen, I, are you still out in the garden? You know, are you still there in the weekends watering? And it's like, yeah, I do. Um, so it just seeing the students and seeing them connect and having them be uh, leaders in the community, I think is my, um, drive to wanting to continue to do more with my, with my kids. Thank you. Um, and Heather, we're turning to you for a question about, um, engaging families. What are the most effective strategies as, at getting your families involved? Sure. So, you know, um, I was fortunate that at my school, we prioritized family engagement and had partners where we trained teachers on doing home visits and um, redesigned what conference days looked like and like really kind of presented ourselves in a way that we saw families as the partners in their child's education process, not looking at them from a deficit model of what they can't do and need us to do. But the easiest, I mean, my response around family engagement is always directly connected to student engagement. When students are excited and having a good time in school, they will come home and they will say, mom, dad, auntie, you will not believe what we did in school today. 
And that in itself serves as an opportunity to increase engagement. So now the child comes home with a flower that they picked up or uh, some you know, toy, some wire, something that they did, some let me show you what I can do with factors of nine that then creates an opportunity for the family to have a conversation with the child about what's happening. And then when they wanna talk to us, then it's like, well, wait, they came home with some trick that you can do when you're multiplying nines. Or they came home and told me that they made some carrot soup in school. And I'm like, you don't cook in school. And so the key to engagement is to think less about these structured activities that happen every now and again and are often not considerate of parents in their time, but thinking about what are the things that we are doing and are the engagement activities that we're providing for kids reasonable enough for them to want to go home and be talking about them with their families. The key to family engagement is authentic student engagement. Thank you. Um, and James, I'm going to uh, ask you to kind of address two questions and you may leave them together or they might be separate. One is simple, is there other research that we ought to know about as we communicate with families and school leadership about evidence that, that connecting students with nature is important? Um, the other thing is, it's an interesting question, are we serving them all the same when we talk about equity and doing this work? Wow, okay, two good questions. Um, actually, I think I will answer them separately. I mean, the, the interesting thing is that the notion of green education is, it's, it's catching on nationally. And there's a lot of really great research that's happening all over the world. And I think that if we, you know, were to take the time to do, you know, even a basic Google search, um, you can um, turn up dozens and dozens and dozens of articles, um, you know, going back for almost the last 10, 15 years that, you know, illustrate the, the importance of this. You know, one of the, um, the things that I'm really enjoying is um, the research that has been coming out of China um, from the Anji Play movement, um, which is basically a um, risk-based education learning paradigm that was created in, in a region of China called Anji province. And it's basically teaching kids to learn how to problem solve and to um, have positive experiences in an educational setting by, you know, building um, forts that will probably fall down from um, skinning their knees, you know, <laughs> risking broken bones and all, all the things that kids are prone to do. Um, in the outdoors, you know, and, and having the ability to simply be children, you know, and, and as it happens, it gives really great long range, longitudinal, long range, positive impacts on every other aspect of their educational experience. You know, um, they learn how to not only be um, logical problem sol solvers, but also critical thinkers, you know, and, and I think that 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 and, that, and this is for for um, toddler to preschool um, age children. And we're not talking about, um, you know, kids who are even at a, at a reading level yet. We're talking at the very basics of early childhood education. So yes, um, there's a lot of really great research happening all the time. And, and the great thing about it is that every person on this panel is part of that research by demonstrating every day the proof of concept. In answer to your, to your other question um, with regard to are we um, allow, are, are we serving every child equitably, I'm going to have to say unequivocally the answer is no, you know, and I think that a big part of that is just simply because, you know, too many young people are de denied the ability to, to spend time outdoors, even recreationally, let alone from a, from an educational standpoint. You know, and so that if we were to make it possible so that, you know, you have children with, an, with access to green space as a matter of course, I think we will be much better off with young people not only being able to recognize, you know, their place in the world in, in a, from a natural standpoint, but also just from um, an, an equity standpoint to recognize that as human beings, you know, the natural environment treats us all, all the same. 
our society te treats us differently. You know, so much so that you've got young people, spe specifically young people of color, who who say the outdoors is dangerous. You know, nature is dangerous. It's not a place that I should go because my parents tell me that it's not safe. Um, and that's among the many prohibitions that create inequitable access to the outdoors. We have to break down the cultural and psychological barriers as well as the socioeconomic and proximal <laughs> barriers. You know, we have, you know, notions culturally that limit access to nature by virtue of the fact that people don't think that they belong and we need to fix that. Thank you. You just uh, gave us a lot of things to think about. Um, in a, in a what I really appreciate that question from whoever put that in the Jamboard. Um, I want to start wrapping this up. This has been a really rich discussion and I love the questions and the takeaways that people are um, posting. I encourage everybody to engage with the Jamboard a little bit further and see what other takeaways and questions people have put out there and, and turn to somebody, a colleague and, and get into that discussion. This is work that can't easily be wrapped up. Um, I, I always encourage people to lean into the non-closure. This is not a conversation that is ending, but only beginning.